It was policy that when conducting first contact with a new sapient species, that an ambassador of each species with a seat in the Galactic Coalition, the GC as humans put it, be present. The GC and humanity distinctly remembered their day of first contact. When the alien races arrived with an armada, humanity thought they were there to invade. When the aliens instead sent a terrified transmission, begging to be spared of humanity's nuclear and fission armaments, pleading that we would not obliterate them, as our many simulations depicted, they were referring to movies, and instead conduct peaceful diplomacy, it was a riot for the whole planet. Humans still enjoy rewatching it on visualizers from time to time. But that was a while ago. Today, humanity was just another seat in the GC. Granted, they were still known as one of the most dangerous and volatile species on it in both culture and biology, but now that just amounted to an increased insurance rate for ships with humans aboard, rather than quite yelps of terror each time one walked by. Usually the benefits of human strength, resilience and ingenuity outweighed this increase. However, it still made the necessity of a human ambassador on first contact missions a matter of debate. The intent of first contact missions was to represent all the species in the GC, but it was also to show that the GC wasn't a threat. It was an open hand of invitation. Putting a human on the first contact shuttle was like putting a gun in that hand. Even if everyone in the GC knew that the gun wasn't actually loaded, the species being made contact with didn't, and humanity's forward-facing predatory eyes, their absurdly dense musculature, their flesh-eating diet and stiff bipedal posture made for a very big gun. Because of this, Ambassador Julian Rushford has spent every first contact mission making himself as small and non-threatening as possible, but half the time that just made the new species worry about the appearance of a stalking predator. It had reached the point where the most proven effective way to assure the new species that humanity in the GC wasn't a threat to them was for Julian to wait on the ship until the other ambassadors had done all the work, then introduce the human ambassador from a safe distance. And so it was that Julian was currently reclined in the rather cramped deck of the ship, filling away at his holophone and waiting for the others to finish the job he'd trained his whole life for on this newest first contact mission. He didn't have to wait long. The airlock swooped open, and the other 23 ambassadors rushed inside with terrible looks on their faces, practically running each other over in their haste. Why weren't we warned of this? How did we even discover this species? cried Vorlak, the Wimu ambassador, and the ship's captain by seniority. His six feelers thrashed wildly in a show of panic. They found us. They sent an eater wave transmission and told us where to find their world and requested first contact. That's it. No official data. Shouted back Kick Nick with twelve wide eyes. This was a mistake, despaired Filler. Her watery form slowly sinking further into her bulky atmospheric regulator. We can't go back there. What's going on? Julian Folly cried out, standing up and almost hitting his head on the deck's roof. What happened? The human! called Giffick. We can send the human out. No way, protested Vorlak. Not even a human will stand a chance against that. Those things make humans look like Crythons. Uh, no offense, Filler. Filler had already sank into a helpless puddle in her atmospheric regulator and couldn't respond. Julian was shocked. All humans knew that they were the equivalent of space orcs to other species, and Vorlak had just claimed that this new species made them look like a semi-rigid water-based organism. If humans were space orcs, what must this new species be? Julian swallowed a lump that had formed in his throat. Surely Vorlek had to be exaggerating, and yet the other ambassadors were nodding in agreement. What do they look like? Julian asked, morbid curiosity taking hold. Kick Nick handed him a visualizer. Leave it to the 12i Synaptori to capture visual data, even as they were fleeing in panic. Julian braced himself to see something straight out of ancient Lovecraftian mythos, but when the visualizer turned on, his lips twitched into a smile he simply couldn't hold back. Oh, I'm going out there, he declared. Human, did my translator identify excitement in your voice? Vorlak gasped. Don't worry, I'll be right back, Julian waved back, still beaming. What Vorlak had said about him not standing a chance against the species he saw in the visualizer was true, but there was no way he was going home without meeting it in person. It was a short walk from the landing pad to the enormous conference tent that had been set up for the first contact. When Julian walked in, he tilted his head back to look up at the species and fully take it in, the smile still on his face. Oh, this one's new, and he isn't immediately running and screaming like the rest of them, that's a relief. But he's barely any larger than them. Are we sure this isn't just how their species exhibits fear? Julian spoke up, 
Apologies on my companion's behalf, they scare quite easily. You must admit, though, that you are quite a terrifying sight for ones of such smaller size, and without the teeth, claws, and spikes you display. There? See? He's just as scared, if a bit braver. Oh, not at all, Julian corrected, still beaming at the sight before him. I wouldn't have missed this meeting for the world. And yet you lack all the features you just attributed to us. So why is it you are not afraid? Does your species lack fear? No, we have it, Julian answered. But you actually bear a striking resemblance to a creature that humans, my species, tell fantastic stories of. Really? And what do you call these creatures in your stories? Julian couldn't help but let out an abrupt laugh at his remarkable position. If one back on Earth was going to lose it when this species got formally introduced at the GC. You look an awful lot like what we call dragons. The first contact mission was a success, to the disbelief of all 23 other ambassadors. At their formal introduction, it was unanimously decided that humans would be the ones to act as guides to show these new dragons the ropes of the GC and interacting with freighter races and their fears. Even the human representative had voted for themselves, much to all the others' dismay. None of them could fathom how humanity could possibly be so excited to interact with a species that made even them seem frail, but needless to say, it was never again questioned the necessity of a human ambassador. Do you really just sit in here practically the whole time while the others go out and do the actual introductions? asked Phyla Nambitar, the newest ambassador to join the Galactic Coalition's first contact team. Yep, answered human ambassador Julian Rochford. Last time was the exception. Last time, it had been first contact with Vrylamanectar's species, who bore a remarkable resemblance to Earth mythology dragons, and as such, only the human had dared get anywhere near them. The official name for their species, much like the one of the ambassador Julian was speaking with, was a lengthy and hard to pronounce one, Geros Foliantival. So when it came as no surprise that when the humans simply refused to call them anything but dragons, the nickname stuck. Before the dragons, the humans and their homeworld that was harsh enough to give rise to such a species were both considered anomalies. Now that there was another like them, to surpass them even, such civilizations needed to be categorised. And so it was that the space orcs and space dragons were both labelled Deathworlders. That's ridiculous, protested Thriller, as Julian called her. The whole point is showing new species we aren't a threat. How are we going to do that if we're hiding like predators in ambush? Julian explained his many attempts at an alternative approach, to simply waiting for the others to smooth everything over first, and then introduce the human from afar after. Ugh, at least I have you to socialise with. How did you manage it on your own? she asked. Usually playing games on my holophone, he answered with a yawn and a stretch of his arms. If nothing else, the requirement to double the floor and ceiling space in the ship to accommodate the Dragon Ambassador was a much welcome change to the prior, crammed ship that had been made before the humans joined the GC. Apparently when the GC first formed, first contacts with new species only occurred every century or so, but these days, with so many expanding civilizations flying around, it was closer to once a year. If I yawn like that, the others would be instinctively shrieking in terror, Frilla smirked. Gideon chuckled, knowing she was right. You know, even I don't get how you humans aren't afraid like the rest. Don't get me wrong, I much prefer having someone to hold a normal conversation with, but it is puzzling. We call it pack bonding, Junior replied. Basically, if it doesn't immediately try to kill us, we try to make friends with it. Sounds like a good way to get killed. Julian shrugged. Yet, here we are, and back on Earth we've domesticated just about half the planet. Frilla shook her head in bewilderment. I read about your world, and I'll admit, I can't decide if it's more insane than you tried, or that you succeeded as many times as you have. What have you, didn't it? Julian jabbed playfully. Like, what? I have not been charmed by some alien species' wiles, she protested in the face of Julian's laughter. Julian sighed away his laughs. He wondered when the others would be back. This one was taking a bit longer than usual. This time the ambassadors had learned from the last mission, and made sure to get visual ID on the new species, who had named themselves Hooklio before making first contact. Julian hadn't bothered to check the visualizers himself. It wasn't like he'd be meeting them up close and personal anyways, and he was busy teaching the ropes to Thriller, the stuff the textbooks wouldn't. As it was still humanity's responsibility to make sure they integrated into the GC easily, He'd heard some remark from Kicknick about whether they were sure this actually was a new species, 
But whether it was or wasn't, him and Thriller wouldn't be the ones finding out. The airlock opened. New ship, same swoop. Vorlak stepped in and addressed them. Alright, they're ready for you two. Remember not to smile with your teeth. Finally! Thriller exclaimed. First contact! Vorlak stepped up beside Julian as they walked. You'll like these ones. They're like humans, but less threatening. Julian was surprised by the comment. Like humans? Vorlak seemed way too at ease for them to be that much like humans. Most likely it was just another biped. Apparently those are rare. Vorlak stopped them halfway to the designated building. Alright, wait here, we'll bring them outside. And off he went. Frilla sighed. I suppose I wouldn't fit in there anyways. Julian gave her a reassuring pat on the shoulder. Most facilities could barely fit humans when we joined the GC2. We'll adapt. That being said, the structures around them did bear a resemblance to human architecture, as far as the height of their doors and placement of windows and door handles. Biped was looking all the more likely. The door to the building ahead opened as Vorlak started his return, with the new species in tow. Thriller began to smile receptively. No teeth, Julian hissed in quick reminder, before he could cause an incident. Thriller stowed her teeth, visibly having to make effort to smile without revealing them, due to the musculature of her jaw. Julian worried his appearance would be even more off-putting than if she just smiled normally. He sighed quietly, and turned his face towards the new species to give his own best smile. But the smile died before it started. A cold spread out from Julian's heart as it began to beat faster. His breathing turned frantic, his skin turned white and he began to sweat. The Hooklio, those things, Volak was right, they looked like humans, too much like humans, but their skin was too white and dry, bordering on translucent. Their faces looked stretched, their hair too sparse and strand-like, their arms too long, too thin and too wiry, and their eyes. By the earth their eyes. They were black, as black as a void. It was like staring at some twisted thing out of a horror movie. He'd watched horror movies before, he was far from easily frightened, but seeing this thing here in person, and the way it was walking, swaying side to side with his gait, his chest not moving at all, like it wasn't even breathing, his instincts were screaming to run for his life. Thriller noticed as he started to hyperventilate. What's wrong? Are you sick? It's uncanny, was all Julian could muster. It's true. Their resemblance to humans is remarkable. No, you don't understand. It's uncanny. I can't. I have to go back to the ship. What? Why? No, it can't be. Is that the human fear response? That? I'm not scary, but that is. What's happened to pack bonding? I can't pack bond with that. Well, it's almost here, so pull yourself together. If you can talk to my species, you can talk to this one. Why is this still getting closer? Julian wondered. They're just supposed to get close enough to see us and stay at a safe distance. Why is this still getting closer? Here he is, Vorlak announced cheerily. The human, practically your sibling, just as described. Indeed it is, the thing said in an almost sing-song voice. It's a pleasure to meet another species that shares such a close appearance to us. I'm sure our people will intermingle splendidly. Don't count on it, Julian thought grimly. Sweat dripping off of his brow. What was he going to do? These things were going to join the GC, and humanity was going to lose it in an entirely different way than they had for the dragons. He had to do something. He had to say something, but he was paralyzed. Vorlak continued. The humans eagerly volunteered to guide the Jurosov in Timville here through the galactic community. I'm sure they'd be happy to do the same with your people. No! Julian finally blurted. To all of their surprise, even his own. Dang it, Julian, you're an ambassador. Even if these things are terrible, you have to represent humanity in a good light. He closed his eyes. If you couldn't see it, even if he still knew it was there, maybe he could get a grip. I'm sorry, he finally added, but humans will not be able to interact with your species. Vorlak finally seemed to notice Julian's condition. And although he'd never seen a scared human before, he recognized what fear looked like. And if a human was scared, he took a precautionary step back. If Julian had to explain his behavior, he knew he had to. He just had to hope they would all understand. It's nothing against you, it's a human instinct. It's the only thing that all humans fear. Something like that exists? Vorlak blurted. Yes, Julian continued. And it's things that look very close to us, but it's not us. We call them uncanny. Oh, thanks, Zentu, came the sing songy voice, eliciting a what from all three diplomats. Julian even haphazardly opening one eye again to ensure it was the new species talking. It was. To be massively honest, it continued, you look unbearably ugly. 
I've been calling my lunch ever since I got a good look at you, and I was dreading to think we'd have to interact with your kind on a regular basis. I didn't think I could say anything without causing an incident. Julian was just dumbstruck enough that his heart started to slow down to a reasonable rate. You think I'm ugly? Yes. Please, would it make no insult if I look away? No, by all means, please look away. The Hooklio turned away and shielded his eyes. Ah, at last. The both of them started to breathe easier. It seemed his lack of visible breath before it had been due to it being just as rat as Julian had been. It seems we will have a mutual understanding, Julian gave with a half-nervous laugh. It does. I will refrain from shaking your hand as I dread what your visibly oily skin must feel like. No hard feelings here. Your fingers are way too long for my liking. The grateful exchange of insults in the successful mission of first contact will go down in the history books as yet another unbelievable instance of human interaction. Mutually appreciated aversion, it was deemed, with the uncanny valley and the small uglies being cited as both sides reasoned for it. And while many in the GC couldn't understand why two species so close in appearance would avoid each other, they could accept it. Though Junior's life was certainly going to be just a bit more challenging from now on, Maybe one day he'd get used to the Hooklio Ambassador's appearance, but until then, it certainly would be an interesting next few first contact missions. Was there really a necessity of a human ambassador on first contact missions? This was the question that members of the galactic community had once asked. With the success of the first contact mission to the Juros Volentinthal, this question had been answered in the affirmative. Were it not for the presence of a human, none of the other 23 ambassadors would have had success in introducing the GC to the species nicknamed Dragons. Humans were necessary because they were fearless. Or so the GC had thought. It was the very next mission where the human ambassador encountered the Hooklio, a race uncannily similar to theirs, and proved humans were capable of fear. That fear, and the shared but different aversion the Hooklio had towards them, was once again raising the question as their inability to look in each other's general direction and share a workspace was posing new challenges to displaying the GC as a unified and accepting organisation. If this next first contact mission didn't go smoothly, it could very well be Human Ambassador Julian Rushford's job on the line. Even with the Hooklio aboard and having to wait out two thirds of each mission, Julian loved his job. And consider many of the other ambassadors his friends, especially Thriller, the Dragon Ambassador, and fellow Death Order. If powering through his instincts and showing not a shred of disquiet towards the Hooklio was what it would take to keep his job, by the earth he'd do it. This next species made the 27th. By now, the Dragons and the Hooklio were both well integrated into the GC, and Freda was a startling natural at appearing less threatening once she had the practice, honing a technique of moving with a soft grace, an equally soft touch of her foul, dull claws, and perfecting her toothless smile. Julian was as rigid as ever, courtesy of being a biped, but at least he had the same smile. The ship touched down in the dense forest of this newest species world. The trees rivaled the Sequoia Red Woods back on Earth, but these ones covered the whole planet according to the visualizers. This one wasn't a death world, but it had been close. Apparently this planet has some nasty storms and more than one predator, but all that meant was that Julian and Frilla would be staying behind so as not to remind the natives of those predators. The species that they were making first contact with were another rare case that had managed to send the GC a message first, naming themselves Voodoo. It also included depictions of them. They looked almost like teddy bears, small, thick black fur, no visible natural weapons, with the biggest difference of eyes on the side of their head, like a periscope. All the telltale signs of a non-predator species that were fleeing terror at the sight of Julian and Frilla. As the ambassadors filed off the ship, the semi-rigid water species ambassador, named Fila, led the way, having been promoted by seniority when Volak retired. The similarity in her and Frilla Lanbitar's nickname had caused most to simply use Frilla's full name, despite the difficulty it posed. But Julian had insisted he wouldn't mix the two up. When asked how, he proudly replied, Because Fi is ply and it's dragons who fry. The homophone only made sense in the human language, and Frilla had reminded him yet again that her species did not breathe fire like dragons in human mythology. Regardless, he preferred Frilla. Julian leaned back and settled in for the long wait. He glanced over at Frilla. You filed your claws down. I did. What of it? I thought sharp claws were a matter of pride for your people. So is doing your job well, but a dull claw is much more approachable than a sharp one, even for your kind. 
A shame. They were very nice claws. They look good on you. Freddy's neck twisted in an expression of suspicion. Julian, you are not flirting, are you? I've heard tales of what you humans call bards. What? No, no. Julian bolted up in his seat. That would be unprofessional. I meant... But his protests were drowned out by Frilla's laughter. She'd gotten him this time. Your sympathy for my claws is noted, she gave with a nod of appreciation. Time passed. Normally Junior would have passed the time with his holophone, but for some reason he couldn't shake a nagging feeling in the back of his head, and his eyes kept drifting to the permanently dark landscape under the thick canopy of trees. A lingering fear of the dark, he thought. But no, this wasn't fear. It was something different. Something whose existence was debated on even by other humans. Frilla? Have you ever heard of the Sixth Sense? Sixth Sense? Of course. I believe the Glaws have eight senses in total. No, no, not that kind. I mean the human Sixth Sense. Humans have a Sixth Sense? Julian recognised the angle of her head that indicated curiosity. Well, not exactly. It's more of a... A superstition. It's a belief that when something is wrong, something just out of sight, we can feel it deep down. And this is a feeling you are having right now? Frilla asked tentatively. Julian was silent as he stared at the darkness beyond the light of the ship's shed. I don't know. But then he finally saw it. Something didn't match the solid darkness in the bark of trees. There was a barely perceptible discoloration in it just ahead of the ship. Had he been noticing it all along in his subconscious? But I'm going to find out. He stood up and started for the airlock as Frilla took on a shocked arch in her neck. What? You're going out there on your own on a first contact mission? That's completely breaching procedure. It'll cost your job. Julian stopped, airlock hanging open. She was right. And yet. I have to check. I won't go far. He stepped out and turned his holophone to illumination mode, turning it into the equivalent of a lantern. A thud on the ground behind told him Frilla followed him. Are you planning to stop me? He asked, a bit taken aback. Even with her filed claws, he didn't think he'd win that fight. No, I'm not letting you get caught breaching protocol alone. If I'm there too, they might at least be lenient. Write it off as a death order thing rather than a human thing. She lifted her head up to increase her size, a dragon sign that they wouldn't be moved from their decision. Whatever happened to valuing doing your job well? Julian asked, but he was more than grateful to her. My people also value loyalty, she stressed, making her point clear. Julian nodded his appreciation. It was convenient that humans could arch their necks in an imitation of many of the dragon's expressions. The two walked into the forest, where Julian had seen the discoloration. He approached it cautiously, and as the holophone light shined on it, his first reaction was surprise. It was a ship. He examined it more closely. It didn't bear a resemblance to any of the GC ship designs he knew. It had a symbol on the side, and what appeared to be writing, but the translator wasn't giving a written translation. Whoever ship this was, they weren't in the GC. Do you think it belongs to the voodoo? Julian asked. No, I can see the cockpit. The seat is too big for the images we saw of them. Julian examined more of the ship, looking for a way in. It's... overgrown. He started to get that feeling again. That sixth sense. He turned around to face the darkness, and he caught a glint in the darkness. He slowly approached. It was another ship, just as foreign as the first. And there, another ship. And there, another. Abandoned and overgrown crafts hidden below the canopy. This isn't the Voodoo's first contact with other species. They lied. This was a trap. We have to get to the others. Wait, shouted Fuller. Do you feel that? The sixth sense? I don't think I need... No, the eyes. As she said it, the forest almost felt like it quietened. And now that Julian was thinking about the forest, he could feel them. The hair in the back of his neck stood on end, as he could have sworn he could feel predatory eyes studying them. This isn't a sixth sense, Fuller growled. This is death order instinct. What do you think they're waiting for? Same thing all predators wait for. A weak spot. A lapse in awareness. A lagging member of their own. We may have them worried. They may never have seen death orders before. Well, if they're going to wait, we won't, Julian decided. We're finding the others. He started in the direction the other ambassadors had left. Fuller was right behind him, surveying their surroundings with a glare that might have killed any of the ambassadors from heart attack. It took longer than Julian would have liked, but they found a log cabin, though it may have in reality been a branch cabin with the size of these trees. Julian was about to kick the small door in, but he froze. What if he'd gone it all wrong, and he was about to kick the door in on peaceful diplomacy like some rampaging monster? No. No, he'd seen the ships. The others were in danger. 
He kicked in the door, and almost fell straight into the pit on the other side. Julian, Frilla, run! They were just here! They could be back at any moment, and they have terrible weapons! The voice came. It was Nigging's voice. Julian looked down towards it, and saw how the floor had been rigged to fall some 15 feet, and the ambassadors were at the bottom of it. He looked to the walls of the pit. They were a straight drop, but they weren't slicked, and the massive tree root systems didn't allow dense packing of dirt and stones. He could probably climb out by digging his own ladder. He jumped down and did his best to roll to avoid a hard impact. It wasn't perfect. He'd be bruised tomorrow, but what would bruise a human could be life-threatening to some other species. Sure enough, they were injured in the pit. Broken appendages, bent antenna, smashed torques. But everyone looked alive except... What are you doing? Nigne protested. Now you're trapped down here with us. No, I'm not. Where's Filler? He asked. The water-based captain, the most fragile of them all. Evaporation itself was a threat to her life. Nigne pointed. Her atmospheric regulator had been pushed into one of the corners. Julian hadn't seen it because one of the other ambassadors was crashed over it. Her power regulator cracked when we dropped. Sequadel has been showing power from his respirator, but... Julian's eyes narrowed viciously, and then they took an instinctive step back. We're getting out of here, Julian stated, with all the certainty that the sun would rise. How? Maybe you can get out, but we can't, Nidney cried, literally, with all twelve eyes. Julian moved to one of the fallen sections of the floor and hoisted it off the ground. What's our status? He called a thriller. They're still keeping a distance for now. I think we really scared them. Julian grunted with effort as he propped the floor segment against the pit wall, making a ramp. But it was too steep still for those without strong appendages, so he took a step back, lifted his leg, and stopped it down into the wood. It splintered with a crack that made some of the ambassadors gasp in shock. Perhaps they had thought it was Julian's leg that had snapped, but no. And with one more stomp, his foot went through the wood, making a foothold. He repeated the process again, then again, using the holes he'd made as platforms to make the next one from, building a ladder with force of strength and adrenaline alone, as the other stood with mouse agape. Most of them had never actually seen what a human was capable of. Now start climbing, Julian shouted, as the last hole was made. Whether it was to escape the pit or obey the terrifying shouting human, they made no hesitation. Julian helped lift each of them up at the top of the ladder. When the Hooklio ambassador came next, he registered the uncanny appearance and made no delay to take hold of his long-fingered hand and help him up as well. Once the majority were up, Julian slipped back down, hoisted Philo and Sikredal both in his arms, much to their terror, and ascended the ladder with them. Filler's atmospheric regulator alone weighed close to 200 pounds, Julian knew, so he was well aware adrenaline was fueling him to hysterical strength. Don't run for the ship! Stay with Fuller and meet the whole way! Julian barked. The ambassadors were a herd of defenseless sheep now, and he and Filler were the shepherd dogs that would keep the wolves away. They started back to the ship, but it was slow going with some of the injuries. My battery is almost out, Cicladal warned, and at this rate either Fuller and I won't make it. Leave me behind, take my battery. No, Julian barked again. Nobody is getting left behind, and nobody is running out of battery. Once again, he hoisted the two of them, but this time he deposited them on Frilla's back. What are you doing? I'm not a pack animal, she protested in surprise. Julian grunted. Of course not. Only the noblest of dragons in myth carried others on their back, and that's what you're going to have to do to get these two to the ship on time. Are you insane? That's exactly what the voodoo have been waiting for. If I leave, they'll see it as a weakened pack and attack. Good. Frilla's eyes widened, a rare expression of fear. You have gone insane. No, Julian disagreed. I'm furious. Frilla tried to say something in response, but she couldn't find any words. Looking him once, up and down, seeing the tight fist Julian's hands made, as dense as any club, she nodded. All right. And she ran for the ship, calling out behind her. I'm still not one of your mythical human dragons. With only Julian left, the eyes that had been following them began to descend from the trees. They didn't have her mouth visible, Perhaps it was buried under all that fur, but the voodoo made a chittering sound, very unlike a teddy bear, as they descended with gleaming metal pikes in hand, only as tall as they were, practically sticks to Julian. But whatever those pikes were made of, it wasn't medieval. Circuitry brimmed around the edges, and vaso liquid were screwed in to feed into their points. Wherever they come from, just stay together, and keep moving towards the ship. Don't let them turn you around, Julian ordered. And then they attacked. With chittering sounds, they launched at the group. The first one was face down and lifeless in the ground before an ambassador could scream. One blow to the head from Julian's fist was all it had taken. No doubt it hadn't expected him to move so fast or reach so far. The other voodoo were given pause. At the moment, even another human would be hesitant. Adrenaline was a hell of a drug, and Julian was practically frothing at the mouth of it. Little, spear-holding monsters surrounding him. His instincts were a full tilt. 
Years of suppressed emotions for intensive training and exercises to keep the human temper under control, to ensure nobody ever got hurt in a fit of anger. Dozens of hellbound fights over years of interacting with fragile aliens all came bumbling up. And he had no mercy for those deceiving predators who approached his friends. He actually ran at the next one, catching them completely off guard. His foot connected with it like a football and set it crunching into a nearby towering tree. It didn't get up. He roared, actually roared, like an actual orc. The voodoo finally recomposed themselves, and this time attacked in unison. Julian swung and kicked relentlessly. They needed to cover double the distance he did to land a blow with their spears, meaning he connected with one, two, three, four, more, and they hadn't had a chance for one good stab at him yet. He used his legs to dodge attacks as often as he did to get one in the gut and send it sailing, already dead through the air. One jumped for his midsection, and he actually caught it, and in the same swift action he chucked that little gremlin straight into another one that had peeled off to go for one of the ambassadors again. Another one managed to close the distance behind him, and he stabbed his leg with the spear. Julian shouted as electricity and singing poison like hit his nerves, and the gremlins cheered. But then Julian turned and punted the one that had stabbed him, eliciting an audible gasp from the assembled creatures. It was clear they thought one stab would be the end of it. The truth was it may as well have been a joy buzzer and a bee sting. Their weapons weren't designed with a death order in mind. The next fist that landed broke them out of their stupor, and it finally dawned on them just what these little monsters were up against. A real monster. They cried out in panic and fled in every direction. And never try it again, he shouted after them, breathing heavily. As Junior walked back to the ambassadors, they looked absolutely frozen horrified. Nick Nick spoke up. You just killed 23 of them with your bare hands. If a sign up Tory counted it, Julian knew it had to be accurate. He hadn't been counting himself. Nindy continued when Julian said nothing. I knew that humans were supposed to be strong and volatile, but that was just slaughter. And you all survived, Julian gave with a relieved grin. He knew he'd have just as many nightmares about little monsters with spears as the ambassadors would surely have about him. They made it back to the ship where Frilla, Filler, and Psychodile were waiting. Frilla came out to Julian. We heard a roar, like a vicious animal from my homeworld. That was you, wasn't it? He killed twenty-three of them with his bare hands and feet, then they cried out, answering for him. Twenty-three, she echoed. I'm sure I could have killed that many myself if my claws weren't dull, but while defending the others, how did you do it? Let's just say humans are fast, and we make our own stimulants, adrenaline, Julian retorted. I always regret not getting to see it in action, Fuller muttered. Death orders, Nidney muttered in dismay under his breath, like a curse. Speaking of adrenaline, Julian's was running out. He swayed on his feet for a moment and winced as searing pain suddenly appeared in his lower leg. You're hurt, Fuller exclaimed, darting to catch Julian before he fell. It's fine, it was practically a pencil step. Ugh! He tried to put his weight on the wounded leg again, but even though that poison wasn't lethal, now that the adrenaline was gone, it was painful. Come on, hero, Fuller remarked. She shifted his body to get him onto her back, then started for the airlock. I thought you said you weren't one of those mythical human dragons. And I thought you said you weren't flirting, Mr. Noblest of Dragons. All right, fine. Maybe I was a little. Humans do crazy things when we get on an adrenaline rush. That wasn't when it started and you know it. Besides, I for one think it wouldn't be so bad to see your crazy side more often, Bard. Julian blinked, processing what exactly Frilla had just said. When the report came in of the only failed first contact mission to date, the GC was stunned. Their first question was whether it was the human's fault. The immediate and resounding response was, No! Do not ever remove the humans from the first contact missions. We implore you. They are absolutely necessary. 